Hi, everybody, and welcome. <clears throat> um, I, my name is Arjen Poutsma, and I'm going to talk to you about my presentation, Fun with the Functional Web Framework. Last year, I introduced, well, last year here at Spraying IO, I introduced the, uh, the Functional Web Framework, the new thing that was in the uh, in new web framework that we have in Spring 5. This year, I'm going to go a bit deeper, so we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into it. There's a short introduction at the beginning of, the, of what it brings, this functional web framework, and uh, what, what makes it different from the annotation-based MVC that you already know and love. If you want a deeper introduction, then there's two uh, webinars. There's a webinar available on YouTube, uh, and there's also a recording of Spring 1 platform where I basically recreated the entire framework from scratch uh, just to show you how all the pieces fit together and how it all built up. But this is going, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an introduction, but then I'm going to go deeper and show you what's, what more is possible. So what is this functional web framework, you might ask? <clears throat> it's basically the framework that we introduced that has two basic concepts, handler function and router function. Um, like I said, it was introduced in Spring 5, and it basically we did it as an alternative to the annotation-based framework because... Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. For one thing, we got some remarks from, from some of our users saying that they thought the, uh, the annotation-based framework was a bit magical, right? And if, that's, it's, if you're okay with the magic, that's fine. But if it's very hard to debug an annotation because you cannot put a, a breakpoint in it, right? What I said last year at the conference here was basically with the annotation, with any kind of annotation-based programming model, you have the annotation on one side and they have the, the other classes that interpret the annotation on the other side, and these two are not clearly connected, right? So if you want to figure out what the annotation does, you basically have to go through an entirely different API and see how, that, how that's actually interpreted. And you can then, you can build on top of it, right? You can still extend the spring uh, uh, annotation-based framework. You can do your own annotations, your own meta annotations even. Um, but the fact remains that if you would, for instance, like to add another field to request mapping, right, or the request mapping annotation, you would like to have an additional uh, element in there, you can't. Because simply, that's what's provided and you cannot extend upon it in that way. You cannot extend upon annotations in Java, right? It's a single, you cannot uh, build on top of that way. And that's really where the functional web framework really shines, as I hope I'll show you during this presentation. So yeah, introduced in Spring 5, now fully supported with Spring Boot 2. All my samples that I have in my, all my demos use Spring Boot 2. Um, it basically means that the router functions, as we'll talk about later, are going to be automatically picked up by, by Spring Boot. So we start with the handler function. Now, the handler function in this framework is basically the same thing as your annotated request mapping method. Right? So it handles a request. And if it's a function, the function maps from a so-called server request to a server response. Right? This is another feature of this framework. It's very, it's functional, so everything, there's no side effects. Everything is returning something, taking only the arguments that, that are given to it, and then returning something that you can build upon as well, but we'll see later. So a person handler, which sort of takes the role of a controller, you can give it any kind of name, obviously. Um, in this case, I have a repository. I'll show you later. If you can, can you see this in the back? this level, the size of the code. There's, I'm getting to my demo later, the same code will show you and it's bigger font. So if you can't see it right now, you'll be able to see it later. Um, and we basically, so we have in this case, two uh, handler functions, right? One is called show person and the other called show people. And you can see that it does map to a, from a server request to a mono of a server response. Now. I don't think I need to explain any more what a mono is these days because you've probably heard about it enough, but it's sort of a delayed response, right? It's a, it's a future response. So this framework is completely asynchronous, com uh, asynchronous, that's a new word, asynchronous. Uh, um, so you can, and that also has all kinds of benefits. It builds on top of, uh, of Reactor and works as any kind of WebFlex on it application does. So in the first example here, we have a show people show person method that takes a path variable, and then uses that variable to find a particular person in the I, in the repository that we have. If it's there, then we show it with as JSON. Right? So we say uh, find the person. If the person is there, then provide it uh, to the lambda, and then we say server response dot OK. So we're sending a 200 OK response in this case with the content type application JSON, and then the body 
has to be from the person object. That's what we're doing it there. If we don't have it, right, that's where the switch is empty comes from. That's a, a method on mono. It basically means that if there's nothing contained in that mono, if the, the flat map operation or the, sorry, the person repository doesn't have a person for that particular ID, we say create a not found response, right? So that's basically what we're doing here. If it's there, then show it. If it's not there, do a 404. This framework, as you might see as well, is it's a much lower level than your Spring MVC, right? Spring MVC does a lot of things for you. You can just take the path variable, for instance, as a parameter, but in a functional application, you cannot have varying method uh, signatures, right? The, all the functions have to basically look the same. So that's why we're dealing here with the server request. And we can use that server request to get to our path variable. So it's just a different sort of style of doing things. The second example is probably a bit easier to understand. We just get a request. We don't even use the request. And we just go to our repository and say, find me all the people, and then return that as well as JSON. If you have any questions, raise your hand. There's a person running around with the mic, uh, so you might want to wait for him so that everybody can hear your question. If not, I'll repeat the question. So, uh, uh, and I might even spot, skip your question until later. Maybe some things will become more apparent later. So if the handler function is the method itself that handles your request, then the router function is basically everything that we do with the annotations in Spring MVC. So request mapping, both on the method level, but also on the type level. So that's the responsibility of a router function. It maps from a request, once again, to the handler function. So it's an extra step of indirection, basically. Um, and you typically do that. You don't have to, but you typically do that using request predicates. Now, here are a couple of predicates that we already use, uh, that we use here. I'll get back to those later when we do a bit of a deeper dive with these, with these, uh, into these predicates. But for now, you can see the things like get and also accept our predicates basically mapping from a request to either true or false. So does this request map to this particular function, right? If, is it a get method for people slash ID? And is the accept header, does it contain text HTML? That's basically what we're expressing here. So we're building up a bunch of routes here too, as a matter of fact. And one of them is specific for HTML, as you might see, right? So we're building a uh, root for a get method with people ID and accept text HTML. If that's true, then map it to the render person method, which is on the person handler class. If it's slash people and it's still a text HTML, then map it to the render people method. And we do similar things for JSON. And then we say, combine these two things together. That's the bottom line there, HTML and other JSON. And that's the router function that we expose as a, as a beam. Um, and that's basically where my first tip comes in. I'll drop off these cheesy bouncing tips every now and then saying, this is how I think you should use this framework. Um, so there's a nice DSL, right? This whole routing DSL, especially if you use Kotlin, uh, it's even nicer. I'm not sure if you saw uh, Sebastian's and Joshua's presentation this morning, where they also showed the Kotlin version of this, right? It basically sits on top of this and uh, as Kotlin can, provides a nicer API, but it's the same building block. So everything you learn here, apart from the syntax, you can also do in Kotlin. It's just that I don't know Kotlin very well, so all my examples are in Java. Uh, but what we're doing here is saying, okay, these roots are any kind of other objects, right? So giving them a proper name like HTML and JSON, and then saying combine these two, makes a lot of sense because it's easier, the code becomes easier to read uh, as we'll show later in a demo, it's as opposed to a very big block of just using the DSL. Make, give them proper names, give them proper scoping as well. So let's take a look at that then. Uh, so we're going to switch over to my IntelliJ. How's this font size? In the back, I mean. <laughs> it, okay, a bit bigger? A little bigger. Come on, be bigger then. See, I'm in presentation mode, but exactly, it's probably not presentation in enough, apparently. Let's get out of there and let's see if we can do it regularly. Come on. No. 
Yeah, I, I have a. I can make it bigger that way. Yeah, but it doesn't work for some reason. Not today. No. Sorry, guys. I have to bear with me. Maybe move up a bit. I'm sorry. The code will is available on GitHub. Uh, I'll publish it later. I just don't want to spend 15 minutes uh, going through my IntelliJ settings. So this will have to do for now. So this is basically the same code that I showed you. Tried to show you earlier. We have a um, a Pathfinder here, where we say uh, uh, it's. It's a component, right? It uses a path repository. Let's take a look at that. That's just a typical uh, reactive MongoDB repository, right? There's no coding here. We just use uh, Spring Data for this. And we have a little uh, a Mongo repository set up. Um, my domain, being an old-fashioned Java developer, I, when I have to do a demo, I think pet store, right? I'm not sure if that rings a bell for some of you, maybe. But that's basically what the domain is. So this is a sort of a pet store where we have like a bunch of pets. They have an ID, they have a name, they have a birthday. Um, then we have the repository that exposes that. Then we have the handler itself. Um, and then we have a bunch of these handler methods, right? So they all fo follow the handler function um, signature. So I'll show you the handler function interface, which is very simple, just has one, it's a functional interface for one, just has one method, handle, given a request, give me a mono of a particular server response, right? We'll get back later right, as to why this is parameterized, but for now, it's just a response. No, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. So, yeah, first method, show the path, given the path variable, I explained how that worked in a minute. But little known fact is that you can also quite easily do just normal HTML rendering with this, right? It's not really, it seems to be targeted either way, uh, maybe a bit towards JSON side of payloads, more like web services rather than websites. But there's really no reason why you can't do both. And this builds upon the same sort of template rendering technology that we use for, uh, for the other Webflux, right? The annotation-based Webflux, it's exactly the same stack. It's just a different API to use it. So here we are returning a rendering response. And the rendering is for HTML, right? So we have a server request. We once again take the path variable. And then rather than returning a body of JSON, we're just going to say create a rendering response of name pets and put this thing in the model. So we write pets. Template is right here. It's just a thing, simple time leaf uh, reactive template, right? Time leaf has reactive support now as well in their latest version, 3.0. So that's what we use. And then we have another one for the uh, pets collection, right? Just a table showing you all the pets. Um, and we use those right here, right here. So we refer to the pets template right there. And here we refer to the pets template. The router here is here. I just defined it as a bean on my component. That's just a way to do it. We, there's a lot of ways to set up this router. We'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes when we, I discuss the various ways of setting up your routing. But for now, just a simple bean that's close to the method uh, will do. And then we'll say, routes this pattern and the accept header to that method. Right? These are Java 8 method references. This means that treat this as a lambda, basically treat this as a handler function lambda, this method. And it, since it has the handler function signature, uh, you can do that in this case. And then we say route it to the other one, route it to render pets. And then we say if it's JSON, if the, if the client accepts JSON, then we show them the, give them the JSON-based methods, basically. There's a lot of ways to improve it, right? So there's a lot of repetition here. There's a lot of uh, other things that you can improve on, but this will do for now. So here we're just using the DSL if you would just one after other say, root this to that, root this to that, root this to that. Um, but it gets better, I promise you. What else can I show? Well, there's a little inserter class, right? Insert some data in my Mongo database. That's not that interesting. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. And then I have a configuration here where we just expose the bean as a person handler. Oh, I actually don't even have to do that because I, I have a component already. Well, it doesn't matter. So let's start this up. Um, 
Let's see if it works, right? Spring Boot 2.02. .02. And a nice thing to note when we start up at some point, here we go. At some point, you'll see in the log, to do the router function mapping, then you see what actually is mapped, right? This is a typical Spring MVC thing as well. The annotation based framework does this as well, show all the mapping at startup. Here we do it as well, but it's a bit more, it's a bit different because effectively a router function like we, the one we have here is just one route, right? You just, but it's composed of a lot of other ways as you typically do in a functional, right? Functional uh, sort of programming style. So we have one route, we combine it with other routes and that's basically what's got printed here. So it says map to get and pets ID and accept that CML to that method. Unfortunately, Java 8 doesn't give you nice two strings for a Lambda. I should file a bug on this because you could consider that this could be very, this could be made into a very nice two string, right? The render pet method is basically handled in this way. It would be nice if it just said person handler dot render pet. So maybe that's something that the GDK will do at some point. But for now, we just have to deal with this. Um, and then we have a bunch of other routes here as well. <clears throat> so it prints those out at startup. And you can even set the, if you set the, 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 the deep, the, sorry, the log, logger level of your, uh, your logging framework of choice to trace or below, you'll actually see more output as well. You'll see more interesting. So, okay, I tried to see if this route would fit, but it doesn't. So it gives you a lot of feedback uh, if it doesn't, if the request that you think would match doesn't actually match. So that's what we try to do. So starting this up, I'm now going to my browser. Um, and where we have a list of pets, right? And I can select one of them and it gives me just a birth date. So there, there's nothing there that's very interesting, but um, it works. That's always nice to know, right? Any questions so far? This is basically the very basic introduction as to this framework, right? Handler function, mapping from request to response. Router function, mapping from request to a handler function. That's all you need to know uh, in the beginning. Any questions? No? Let's move on then. Oh yeah, one thing I would do wanted to show you before we move on with the presentation deck is that I don't particularly care for this, right? It's very, uh, like I said, treat the, my first tip was treat your routes as you would any other kind of object. So why not actually do that by just commenting this out and saying, let's use this instead. So it's pretty much doing the same, except that there's now we give nicer variable names Right, we have one route for HTML, we have a route for JSON, and then we say combine these two, resulting in a composed uh, router function that basically represents both the HTML routes as well as the JSON routes. Just a nicer to read, and later on we'll see even ways to improve on this yet. So let's get back to the deck. So the first way to improve this would be to use nested. Uh, router functions. So a nested router function is uh, is a router function that doesn't map to a handler function, but it maps to a router function. So it's once again an extra level of indir indirection. And with nesting, you can basically, as I say here, remove duplication. There's a lot of duplication. If you saw that example earlier, right? We, we had the path was duplicated a bunch of times. The text HTML uh, constant was copied a bunch of times. There was a lot of duplication in there. Duplication should make you feel bad, right? As we all are developers, don't repeat yourself. Uh, so yeah, let's try to get rid of that. And you can do so by using nested roots. So initially here, we're gonna say, I want you to nest the acceptance of text HTML. So that basically what that means is that it applies to any kind of routes that you define afterwards. So accept HTML applies to both render person as well as render people, okay? And then we do the same for JSON. And then <clears throat> you might also notice that we don't really put out, fill out the full pass anymore here. We just say slash ID, or we even say just method get, just meaning I only care about the method, I don't really care about the path is. And we nest that even further. If you look at the bottom line, we say nest the path and then combine that with the two routes that I just defined, okay? So we're saying, for instance, render person should 
apply if or should be accept request if the uh, uh, the method the path is slash people slash ID and the method is get and it's also HTML. Is that clear? I hope so. Once again, I'm going to go through the code right now in a minute, so you'll show me show you a bit more details. But this is very good. So if you compare the one and the two, if you it's not a key important if you can't see this in the back, but if you compare the two, you can really see how this is a nicer way of representing things. Right? It's just less repetition. If you want to change, for instance, your JSON to another, right, so it's like a custom media type or something like that, just one place to change it rather than doing it in a whole bunch of places. That's why you would use nesting. So switching again now to the IntelliJ. So take this out, use this instead. I have to get some, I have to import some things because that's, yeah, that's the one I want. All right, here we go. So here, let's go, let's go through it a bit more simpler, a little bit slower. Here we're saying the HTML route is an acceptance of HTML, so that it basically means that the browser is sending, or the, the client, I shouldn't say browser, it shouldn't, it's not necessarily a browser, it can be a curl or it can, be any, it can be any kind of HTML client. The accept header has to include text HTML. That's basically what we are expressing here. And one thing that's nice about this, right, debuggability, I can just go there and see what it is, what the code is, what does it do. Right? This is not easy to do with the annotation-based framework. Right? I just pressed um, Command B and just jumped into it, and now I can see what's going on. That's nice to have. The same applies to this one, for instance. Right? You can see that it's the get predicate is actually just a very simple predicate made up of a method it's get and the path is that. So we're just composing these simple predicates, very simple building blocks. And these are the same building blocks that you can use as well in your application. Let's go back. So we're nesting based on XML. So that basically means all the routes that we, that, that we define here also have the same uh, predicate applied to it. So meaning they should accept HTML. And then we do the same here with JSON. And then we say, both of these, I want to nest that with a path. So that effectively means that we end up with the same path that we had here, right? So pets is basically everything that you, every path that you see here should have pet, uh, uh, pets as a prefix, more or less. Now nesting is quite a nice feature uh, for this purpose, right? You can do um, nesting on any, any kind of predicate, and it basically means that the predicate will apply to all the routes that you define onwards. You can use it with patterns. You can use it with, uh, and the nice thing about using it with patterns, as you've already seen, is that it sort of remembers, well, it's not a proper term, but I'll use that for now. It sort of remembers the, that this thing also applies here, so the, in effect, this becomes pets, right? It's part of the scope, I should probably say it that way. So let's start this up, see if it still works. Parsing Java. Do, do, do. All right, so you can also see that nesting gives you a nicer uh, to string in a way, right? So the whole, the thing I showed you earlier, the, 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 the log, now is a little bit easier to read. So, okay, we're mapping everything paths to, if it's an accept with text HTML, then this applies, right? So you have sort of a hierarchical view of what's exactly mapped. So it's very nice to use for debugging purposes and other, uh, other reasons. So yeah, we see the get and the ID, they go there. If it's just a get, go there. And then the same for application JSON. If it's a get with ID, go there. And um, now you could take this one step further, right? There's still some repetition in here because effectively these blocks, these two blocks, this one and this one are quite similar, right? The only thing that's really different is the media type. So HTML versus JSON. And the other thing that's different are basically the two handlers that you need to point to. So I could write another maybe private method 
that I use call from this method and saying, okay, for text HTML, go to render path or render pets, right? And for JSON, I go to show path or show pets. That's how it could refactor it. But at that point, I'm not sure if it's still that readable anymore, right? You sort of lose that. There's a balance always when getting too, too generic in a way, it reduces the readability of the code. So I kind of like this. This is just enough uh, generic, genericism for me, but not uh, without losing any of the detail. All right, so that's basically nesting. You, once again, a nested route allows you here to route to another router function. It also says so in the Java doc, right? Route to the given router function is the router get plots. All right, back to the deck. So earlier I already talked about request predicates and now we're gonna look into those uh, deeper as well. So the request predicate is basically what's used by the route method that you saw earlier. It's very simple. Very simple mechanism applies there. If the predicate applies, then return a given handler function, right? If it doesn't apply, then return nothing. That's basically the very easiest way we set up the, the router function. So we, there's a lot of predicates provided. These are the ones that we provide out of the box. HTTP method, right? Get, put, post, etc. The path, obviously, right? We use the same exact path pattern matching algorithm that Spring Webflux does as well, the, the annotation-based version, so there's no difference there. We have a, uh, an, a one for a path extension as well. So you do like dot text, or you could do like a dot, uh, I don't know, just the extended file extension, basically. You can do testing based on a file extension. You can do uh, querying based on the, I'm sorry, you can do routing based on the query parameter, right? So if later on, I'll show you an example of that. And obviously you can also use the headers. There's one generic one, a generic uh, request predicate, but there are specific ones for content type and accept because those are used quite a lot. This is a building block. This entire framework is more or less meant for you guys to build upon, right? If there's not, if you have a specific use case or specific routing mechanism, right? You want to route based on, you want to do a little bit of simple content negotiations, for instance, right? If it's, if the accept header is HTML or if the extension is HTML of the path, right? So .html, then the consumer wants, probably wants uh, HTML representation. And I'm going to show you later how easy it is to do this. Um, you could write, for instance, a predicate based on the host header, right? If you have some multiple, you're hosting multiple sites from the same address, you, from the same app, you could say, well, if the host is this, then route to that. If the host is that, then route to another one. You could even do a little bit, I know it's a, it kind of shows you my HTML programming skills that I mentioned user agent here, because I know that you're not supposed to do that, right? User agent check-in. But still, if you would, for instance, check if the user agent contains the word Mozilla, right? Chances are that that's a browser. You're talking to a browser. So they want to probably see HTML, uh, that kind of stuff. The easiest way to do that, to create new request predicates, is probably just to compose existing ones, as you would typically do in a functional, any kind of functional application. Right? You say, uh, if this applies and that applies, or if this applies or that applies, then go there. And that's what I'm going to show you in a demo right now. So my tip here is saying, if you have specific routing requirements that are not captured by the ones that we provide, build your own. It's very trivial. In a minute, I'm going to show you how. And it's really what this framework is meant for. Right? We're not going to provide you anything out of the box, or we're going to make it very easy to build on top of it. That's the philosophy of this, of this specific web framework. So demo time again. Uh, so going back to my handler, I'm going to do attempt a very simple version of, of uh, content negotiation, right? Um, we don't provide anything out of the box for this because I think it's sort of specific per application what you mean by uh, what is an HTML request or what is a browser request versus what is a, uh, uh, what is a, a non-browser request. And, but we do make it very easy for you to build on top of it. So down here at the bottom, I actually have created two request predicates of my own, just as private little accessors. Um, the one is called is HTML, and that basically means that if the accept header 
is HTML, if the accept article contains HTML, or if the query parameter um, called format is HTML, so you can imagine something, a URL like, whoops, HTTP, localhost, yada, 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 and then format HTML. Oops, I can't type. Format HTML, then it will basically, this one applies. And it's an or, right? So either can apply. It's not, it's either or. You can also use and, but that's obviously not applicable in this case, but there's also an and uh, just to show you. And the or is just implemented once again, very easy to debug. You just go and step into it. You can see that its implementation is just trivial. Uh, even go a bit deeper. And if you're building your own, it might be useful to know if you're building your own request predicates that uh, we use all the formatting you saw earlier, all that nice logging, is basically just the two string on the predicates. So if you write your own predicate from scratch without composing of existing ones, you want to provide it with a proper two string, basically, because we'll use that two string in the log to print out your predicate. Okay. We have a similar one for JSON, right? If it's except header contains application JSON or the query parameter format is, uh, is JSON, then given the JSON response. So we want to use that. I'm going to comment out this bean again and open this one up. We're using it right here. In the HTML route, we're saying instead of using the accept, we're just going to switch to using this predicate down below. Uh, I could have even done it inline, right? I could have said like so, and I say accept, etc. Well, the easiest way to accomplish that would be say this, I think. See? It's the same thing. It comes down to the same thing. But, yeah, undo. This is nicer to read, obviously. Readability is, is important. Okay, so. If I start this up, you'll start seeing as well in the logs that there's now, it's a bit more complex, right? But we still try to do our best to provide you with the most information. So if, if accept HTML is true or for, query format, basically query parameter format is HTML, then go there, and we'd have the similar thing here. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna start up my terminal now. Oh, that has to be bigger. It has to be a lot bigger. So now, oops. I can get the JSON by saying format is JSON. Ugh. Remember the curlies. No, I can't. Maybe it didn't start up. Let's try that again. I can do it from the other side though. I can show you in the browser probably. That's easier. So this still works. Well, if it starts up again, it still works. Come on, there we go. So now I can say query format is JSON and it should show me JSON, but it doesn't. So I have no idea what is, what's going on here. So much for the demo, gods. Uh, let's not focus on that then. <laughs> I wanna give it one more go. No. Nope. Yeah, probably it is, but I should be able to get it from the, from here then. That should be no problem. Anyway. Not going to be bothered by that. Move on. It's, um, it's a powerful mechanism, right? And you can see any place where you can use, in, in where you use these request predicates. So that's both in the standard route, router method, the route method, right? Routes that we use, that you typically use to compose these routes, you have a predicate and you have a handler function, so this can be your predicate, right? But it can also be 
one of the ones that we provide. So here's the list of ones that we provide. There's one that basically means all, all the requests go somewhere, one for methods, one for path. And you can, I already showed you, but you can also see that some of these, like for instance, the get and, and all the HTTP header ones are compositions themselves, right? We just compose based on methods and path, uh, just like you could do yourself. Oh yeah, here's the tracing that I talked about earlier. So we, every time we try to apply one of these predicates, we'll, if you look at your logging level set on trace, you'll see that happening. I don't have trace enabled right now because it basically would mean that the entire log is no longer readable. There's so much tracing going on. But if you want to know why your, your router function doesn't match, then putting it on trace is a, is a good idea. All right. I have 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes. So now let's talk a little bit about organizing these router functions, right? So far, I've defined all the routes in one place, one at bean method, where I just said, it's this route with that route with that route using nesting, etc. cetera. But um, you can imagine that if you build a completely a big web application with multiple, yeah, multiple handlers, maybe multiple uh, controller classes, controller type classes, then it will get out of hand. It just becomes unreadable. So. The first way is, is the single at bean router function is good enough most of the time. Um, but if you want to take it a level further, there's, there's more things you can do. For instance, you could say, alternatively, you could have like one uh, router function per handler class uh, and then expose those to, through bean. So let's say I'm going to show you later that my, uh, uh, my domain has not just pets, but also owners. Um, so we have an owner handler and a pet handler, and they both have their own router functions. Right? I could define that in my configuration class as one, one basic as one, but I, I chose to do that basically separately because it basically gives me the scope, uh, limits my scope to, to the particular handler class itself. Or, and that's what it's something I'm going to show you in my demo in a few minutes, uh, you can basically compose these router functions at a higher level. So this is basically what I mean this is what I mean with, with, with composing them at a higher level, right? We have a pet handler that we saw earlier, has its own router for just routing to those particular pet methods, uh, pet-based methods, and then we have an owner handler uh, where we expose another router function, and then in our configuration class, we compose those two again. We put them together, and it gives us all kinds of nice uh, opportunities to do filtering and stuff on that level, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute as well. So, once again, demo time. So here's my other piece of the domain. I have, uh, no, here it is. You don't need that. Owner, right? It's another data class using Lombok. We have another owner repository, once again, a reactive from owner. And then we have a handler, which is very similar to the pet handler that we showed earlier, but it, this one doesn't do HTML. It only does uh, JSON use a repository to do pretty much the same. So I could do add a bean here, all right? And then add a bean here. Uh, and then those, both of those beans will be picked up by Spring Boot. And that if everything goes well, then I should have, oh, no, I probably, I did forget something. So I should also expose these, this one. Make that a bean, because otherwise it won't be picked up. And if everything goes well, yeah, see? Now we have basically, it maps owners and, and this to that function, and then we have another mapping, right? So the router function mapping, that's basically the component that will detect these router functions. It detected two, it says the, this is one, we mapped owners, etc., and then we here we have the other one for pets. Later on, I'll show you how to combine these two at a higher level, but for now, I could just do this. Um, 
if you compose them at a higher level, though, there's other nice things you can do. So another way to do it would be to say, let's get rid of all this. Let's not take a look at this yet. It's coming later. Mm -hmm. Rather than making them beans, these routes, just make them a normal method, as I'm, no, as I'm doing here. All right. So it's just a normal method that, that somebody can expose. And we do the same here, right? We're not making this a bean anymore, just make it a return type. And then at our top level configuration class, we say, I define a bean called main route, which is the one main route. And I want a reference to a pets handler, an owner handler, also a security manager, but that's not important right now. I'm going to talk about it later. And we just say, take that pets route, right, that one, and combine it with the owner route. And that's going to be my main function, or my main router function. So if I do that, you'll see that rather than having two separate log entries, you'll see one log entry, because we effectively now only have one router function composed of the two. See, it's meant to buy a bit quickly, but it, there it is. So pets, see, it's only meant to map pets to that. And then the owner is down here below as well. And that's, I think, especially considering the thing I'm going to talk about next, which is filter functions. Um, doing it this way, I think is the best way to do it right now, because it gives you the sort of the granularity at the high level. You can just say route to these handlers. And in each specific class, you can just put the domain-specific knowledge of routing uh, uh, for each of these individually. All right. And the final topic for today is, uh, and maybe even the most interesting part, is the handler filter function. So it's basically another function. This one maps from a server request and a handler function to a server response. And the handler function, as you can see in the little code snippet here, actually represents the next function in, in the chain. So you can imagine, if you ever did server programming, you probably know about the servlet chain, right? You have a similar sort of mechanism where you have these filters set up, and every filter needs to pass on to the next one in order to make it proceed. This is basically the same mechanism, but then it's done in a uh, more functional way. So you get access to the request, and an X, and then you can do stuff like this. This is my extremely simple uh, security manager class. I'll show you in a minute. But it says, does something in that filter. We say, if it has access, if given this request, if the currently logged in user or whatever has access, then pass it on to the next one in the chain, right? That's the next.handle request. If not, then just return a forbidden response. So you're just going to say, no, access denied. But there's a lot more possible as well. And these kind of things, these filter functions, are basically things you want to use for cross-cutting concerns. Right? So things like security, things like logging, but also for things like putting stuff into the model, as we'll see later. You can do that too. So once again, demo time. And now it also becomes apparent, I hope at least, why I choose to conglomerate these routes at a higher level. Is basically, now I can say, in my configuration class, I can say, I want to filter these. So I'm going to use, start off with a very simple uh, filter. This is my security filter function that I wrote myself. Now, please don't do this. Just use Spring Security. Right? <laughs> <laughs> don't try to run security stuff. But um, and just see how stupid it is to do this. I, my implementation of this is even more stupid So because it's just random. right? Randomly, you'll get to decide if you get access or not. <laughs> just to prove your point that you shouldn't do this. Um, I just certainly hope that there's no random stuff in Spring Security, Joe. <laughs> Definitely, not. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, all right. So this is my stupid security manager. Um, but uh, where am I? Here we go. No, here I am. I use that in my filter. Right? So this one implements a handler filter function. Um, 
uses the that security manager and just says, like I just showed you, if you have access with the given request, then pass on to the next one in the chain. If not, then just say verboten, essentially. Uh, and we apply that to the filter. So I could also choose, right, this is because I want to apply this on a global level to all the things, um, I can say, um, I apply this now globally, but you can also do this on a global level, right? On a local level, I could say, I only want to apply this to the pets. And then I put it here, right? But let's not do that, because this is the better place. Okay, so. I'm sort of running out of time, so I might not have time to demo this bit, but um, it's also hard to demo because you random is very unpredictable, as you might know. <laughs> so <laughs> I cannot really tell upfront whether my access will be allowed or denied, but we'll see how, how far I get. All right, so let's read that again. Yeah, this works. Nope, this one doesn't work. It's if you can, you probably don't, can't see that, but somewhere in here, there is, no. Assume that it's basically uh, a 403, right? So let's try that again in the, in the, uh, there you go. I should probably do a minus V just to get the response status. Yeah, forbidden, see? So now it, it doesn't work, now it doesn't work, now it doesn't work, oh, there we go, now it works. But like I said in the example, in the, in the slides earlier, it's not just for stuff like this, it's also for putting stuff into the, uh, or, or manipulating the model or view, maybe, or manipulating whatever kind of response uh, you have. So earlier I showed you in the path handler that there's basically all these rendering methods that, use the, that render the HTML they return a rendering response rather than a server response. And I told you at the time saying, well, I'm gonna explain later what it is, and this is where I explain why I did that. So in my date filter function here, which I'm gonna to apply to all requests, all, all kinds of mappings, I'm gonna say, if the server response, so first I'm gonna invoke the one, right? So I'm just gonna let it be invoked. Let's let, just let it be invoked, the, the handler function, but then, if it is a rendering response, then we're gonna add something to it, just the date, right? Or you can imagine you could do, this would be a shopping cart or it could be any kind of object that you wanna basically be applicable to all your requests. Uh, and then if you look in my templates, you'll see that the date is actually rendered here below, below a uh, horizontal bar. So I'm gonna disable my security filter for now because it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to enable the date filter. So if everything goes right, you should be able to see the date at the bottom of the uh, of the web page there. Okay. So here we are. Let's get rid of this stuff. See, there you go. There it is. And this is sort of similar to having, for instance, a model attribute annotation on a class, right? Where you're gonna apply a, uh, a attribute to the entire, uh, wanna put something in a model for a lot of uh, uh, controller methods. This is more or less doing the same thing. You can also manipulate the response. If you're just returning entities, you can manipulate those as well. You could check if people have sufficient rights to look into those, for instance. All that kind of stuff is possible with these filters. It's a very powerful mechanism. And that, I think, is all I have time for today. Because now I have about one minute, <laughs> well, a few minutes left for questioning. Are there any questions? If not, I'll be up for here as well. I'll be down below, you can approach me. But if you have a question for now, no? Oh, there's one in the back. Wait for the mic, please. Um, could you maybe explain what is the best practice regarding the global exception handling uh, in this uh, reactive style when we do it? You could, exception handling is another thing you could very, very well do with, with, uh, uh, with a filter, right? If there's some specific, I could easily write a filter where, 
let me just see. Uh, where rather than saying, I want to flap map on a response object, I want to flap map, I don't know the exact method on mono, but there's definitely a, mono, a method on, on mono where you can say, if the, if the result is a, an exception, then treat it as this. Um, let's see what I'm gonna switch. No. On error, see, on error map, that's basically what you use. So you're getting an exception from the handler function rather than a response object, you can use this and then map it still to a response object. That's just, that's basically where filters are very useful for. Does that answer the question? Yes, thanks. All right, <laughs> very good. Well, that's all we have time for for now. Once again, I'll be here for a couple of more minutes and then uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.